Okay, so diagnosing or the clinical signs of PE is very difficult to differentiate from other uh, differentials. So what's important when, when trying to see if a person has PE, it's important to look at their risk factors. And what has been developed is what's called Wells Criteria. This is a modified version. But it's a, Wells Criteria is essentially a list of factors that is given a score and this will tell you if the patient uh, is more likely to have PE or not. So these factors include DVT-like symptoms, which will give you a score of 3. Um, alternative diagnosis less, less likely than PE will give you a score of 3. Heart rate greater than 100 will give you a score of 1.5. Immobilization more than 3 days or surgery in the previous 4 weeks will give you 1.5. Previous DVT, 1.5. Hemoptysis, 1. Malignancy is 1. And tallying this up, you get a total score. If your score is greater than 4, pulmonary, pulmonary embolism is, is likely. If you have it less or equal to 4, pulmonary embolism is unlikely. So using the Wells criteria, the total score, the outcome you get, you use that to help in your diagnosis. So what we will look at next is diagnosis of PE using an algorithm. But before that, we have to learn more about the D-dimer assay because it's, it is an important part, you can say, of diagnosing or, or, um, or ruling out pulmonary embolism. So going back to this previous diagram where thrombi occurs, remember that you know, fibrinogen uh, becomes fibrin and you get fibrin, fibrin, fibrin cross-linking. Well, let us look at this step in a bit more detail. So here we have fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is uh, essentially this yellow part. It has segments on the outside of these white things that are called the D segments. Now in the presence of thrombin, which is clotting factor 2A, fibrinogen becomes fibrin. And these fibrin will essentially link together with, with their D segments. It will form cross-links with their D segments. So you get a fibrin cross-linking. In the presence of plasmin, plasmin breaks down fibrin mesh. So basically what the outcome is, you get these D-dimers being formed. These D-dimers are essentially this fibrin breaking off, but the D-segments are still sort of connected with one another. And you're measuring essentially this D-dimer in your D-dimer assay. And it shows you uh, basically uh, your, your, like what's happening in your body if you have a coagulation occurring, if you have clotting occurring. So back to the diagnosis algorithm and the Wells criteria. Using the Wells criteria, you can either have pul pulmonary embolism unlikely or pulmonary embolism likely. We'll begin by looking if you have pulmonary embolism unlikely, and uh, you do the D-dimer essay, and you can, e you can either get negative or you can get positive. If it's negative and it's pulmonary embolism unlikely, then you most likely don't have PE, so you don't do treatment. However, if pulmonary embolism is unlikely but, and you get a positive D-dimer essay, you have to do further investigations, which is the CT pulmonary angiogram. Similarly, if pulmonary embolism was already likely, you go straight to CT pulmonary angiogram. After the CT pulmonary angiogram, you can have three outcomes. It's either you are negative, positive, or unsure. If you're negative, you probably don't have, the person probably doesn't have pulmonary embolism, so you don't need to treat it. If it's positive, Pulmonary embolism is most likely is confirmed, and so you begin treatment. And treatment can be divided into three things. Heparin, IV, low molecular weight heparin, which is subcutaneous administration, and warfarin. And we'll look into this in a more, bit more detail. If after the CT pulmonary angiogram you're unsure, there can be an additional tests performed, such as the ventilation perfusion scanning. Um, and if it's positive, then you can rule rule in pulmonary embolism, but if it's negative, you know, you, the person probably doesn't have PE, so it doesn't need treatment. So I hope that made sense, this algorithm for, di for helping in the diagnosis of PE. Now let's look at the treatments. So treatments can be divided into three parts, general, anticoagulant, or also known as antithrombin, and thrombolytic therapy. Thrombolytic therapy is essentially fibrinolysis, and we'll talk about it a little bit. But we'll go back to step one. 
So for general treatment, oxygen, you give oxygen for hypoxemia. You give them fluids in case of circulatory shock. Um, and you have to avoid diuretics and vasodilators because these drugs decrease cardiac output and uh, in, P, in pulmonary embolism, you usually already have a decrease in cardiac output, so it's dangerous. And um, you can use opioids for pain, but, it's, but you have to be careful of hypotension. Then number two, anticoagulants, which is very important. So anticoagulants is essentially to prevent new blood clots from forming. And it's used for a minimum of three months. So before introducing these anticoagulants and their mechanism of action, it's actually important to revise what the coagulation cascade is, just in a simplified diagram. So here I'm drawing a blood vessel. Now the coagulation cascade can begin either through a, from an intrinsic pathway from inside within or from an extrinsic pathway when there's a damaged tissue. So either way, the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway will lead to a common pathway, which will help convert clotting factor 10 to 10A. 10A then will uh, convert prothrombin, which is clotting factor 2, to thrombin, clotting factor 2A. Thrombin, clotting factor 2A, will then subsequently convert fibrinogen, and we've already talked about this, fibrinogen to fibrin, and then the fibrin will form a meshwork of fibrin-fibrin cross-linking. And if you remember, from the, in the presence of plasmin, it's broken down, releasing the D-dimers. And the D-dimers is used to, uh, to basically measure coagulation activity in your blood. So your D-dimer uh, is one way of measuring your coagulation activity in circulation. But there are other ways to measure your coagulation activity in your blood, such as you can measure your PT and your APTT which we will talk about in more detail towards the end of the video. But essentially, measuring your PT and your APTT measures your coagulation activity. Your PT specifically measures your extrinsic pathway and your common pathway clotting factors. And your APTT measures your intrinsic pathway clotting factors as well as, as, well as your common pathway. Measuring your PT and APTT is therefore useful um, to monitor or to see the effects uh, your an the anticoagulants have on the body. So let us now move on to the anticoagulants used for pulmonary embolism. And the two used are heparin and warfarin. Usually heparin and warfarin are given together uh, with individuals who have pulmonary embolism. There are two types of heparin. There's unfractured heparin, which is administered intravenously, or there is low molecular weight heparin, which is subcut, subcutaneously. So the mode of action of heparin is basically that it inhibits their action or the production of clotting factors 10 and thrombin. And so essentially it inhibits the formation of the fibrin meshwork. Warfarin, on the other hand, is taken orally and takes up to five days to have an effect and that is why we begin warfarin with heparin in order, in order to wait for warfarin to have an effect. The mode of action of warfarin is that it is a vitamin K antagonist and therefore it antagonizes the synthesis of the clotting factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. If you live in Australia, this is, very, this is kind of easy to remember because these are the TV channels. So 2, 7, 9 and 10. So essentially, the effects of warfarin is also like heparin in that it inhibits the formation of here, clotting factor 10, and also 2, thrombin, thus preventing the formation of uh, fibrin mesh. So we begin the pulmonary embolism patient with heparin and warfarin, but then we will discontinue heparin, and, but keep the patient on warfarin um, as long as the INR is okay, as long as the INR is above 2 and below 3. Now, the INR is another calculation for measuring coagulation activity in the body. And we will talk about INR in more detail later on. But essentially, to check the effects of warfarin, the effects warfarin has on the body, you check the INR. For heparin, you check APTT, not PT, 
sorry, this is a mistake. So when INR is above 2 and below 3, you can keep the person on warfarin and you have to monitor this person. And they continue warfarin for about 3 months or lifelong if they are at high risk of developing another thrombus. I hope that made sense. Uh, the third treatment is thrombolytic therapy, and thrombolytic therapy is essentially fibrinolysis. So your aim here is to break down the clots. You're not preventing new clots from forming, but you're breaking down the clots already. And this is used for acute massive pulmonary embolism and shock because you have because it is an emergency. So again, going back to the uh, blood tests we can you use to check for coagulation activity in the blood, we, we talked about D-dimers, we talked about INR, we talked about prothrombin, uh, we talked about PT and APTT. So let, now let's look at these anticoagulant studies in more detail, and I'll talk about four main ones here, because these relate to the heparin and warfarin that I just introduced. These four are prothrombin time, the international normalized ratio, INR, the activated partial thromboplastin time, APTT, and the bleeding time. So your prothrombin time, your PT, is measuring the activity of your clotting factors from the extrinsic pathway and your common pathway, which are, where, which are the clotting factors produced by the liver. And so you're actually assessing the synthetic function of the liver. Or you can also use prothrombin time to monitor the effects of warfarin because warfarin targets the extrinsic pathway and your common pathway as well. The international normalized ratio, your INR, is essentially like your PT, but it's a calculation. And it's to monitor the effects of warfarin, so your extrinsic pathway, clotting factors, you know, and your... Um, common pathway. The normal INR means that you have normal coagulation. A higher INR means that you are less coagulable. A normal INR is 1. You are normal, you have normal coagulation. A higher uh, INR, meaning 2 or 3, means that you are less coagulable. You will bleed more easily. N the third um, anticoagulant study is the activated thromboplastin time, partial thromboplastin time, and this is to essentially monitor the effects of IV heparin on coagulation. Number four is your bleeding time, which is the time it takes to stop bleeding, which is, I think, below 10 minutes is normal, or nine minutes. So I hope you enjoy this video on pulmonary embolism. Thank you for watching.